go direct to a lender and they look at you like they're going to get one deal out of you for the year or maybe lifetime, where they look at it as a broker, where they're bringing the broker is bringing them a lot of volume. Welcome to Multifamily Insights. I'm your host, John Kasman, and I want to thank you for joining us for another great episode. Listen, if you're enjoying this show, do me a quick little favor and leave us that rating and review. It helps other investors find this great content, but also allows us to focus on your needs and get you the solutions you need to drive your business. And listen, if you haven't done so already, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. We've got a fun show. I'm excited for this one today. We're going to be talking to Brandy Shotwell. Brandy Shotwell is a principal at Reno Capital Management in Dallas, Texas. With over 20 years experience in finance and real estate, Brandy has funded over $1 billion in real estate projects, ranging from commercial acquisitions to commercial development. Let's welcome to the show, Brandy Shotwell. Thank you, John, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Brandy, listen, I'm excited to have you on the show today. I went over your bio at a very high level. Why don't you take two minutes and fill in some of those gaps? All right, absolutely. So I have been in finance for 23 years now, and I started out in the single family space in the last um, eight years. I've been in the commercial space. Uh, typically, you know, I fund multifamily. That, that's my sweet spot. But the beauty of it is, is that, you know, I have the single family background. I invest in real estate myself. So I, I bring a knowledge, a lot of knowledge to the table and, and love working with, um, with investors. It's amazing. So 23 years experience, the last eight years yes. focused on commercial, commercial, primarily multifamily, uh, yes. and you are an investor as well. Talk to me yes. just about maybe that transition, right? From going from being in maybe residential primarily to making that switch over to commercial. Like what were some of the challenges and what made you want to make that change? Yeah, so I was I was definitely looking for something different. Um, I love real estate. I've 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 always been in finance, but I've done um, sales. I've done BPOs. I've been an investor. So I've kind of you know played a lot of roles in real estate, but always uh, was in finance. And um, I knew I just wanted something different. And I moved to Texas, and I was like gosh, I really don't want to do single family anymore, but I, I love finance. I, I love numbers. So um, I put my resume out and this commercial mortgage company reached out to me and they said, hey, we'll teach you everything you need to know. And I said, okay. And I took the opportunity and here we are. But uh, the, the, the best thing about it is your clients. I think it's, it's like you, you go, you go from working with one person who's making the, the biggest purchase of their life. And it's, you know, it's very challenging. It's very nerve wracking for them to the more savvy investor who's done this. A lot of times they know what to expect. Um, very open-minded, good people. And uh, you, I've met some of my closest friends in this network, you know, so it's been great. No, I love to hear that. So talk to me a little bit about, you know, Reno Capital Management. How long have you been, you know, um, working with Reno and, and kind of just talk to us about kind of the focus there? Yeah, so uh, uh, Reno is going into its third year. And uh, I started Reno out of a, I, the company I was with prior to Reno was Edge here in Dallas. And um I uh, love, still love those people there, but I, I said, okay, it's time for me to go out on my own. It's time for me to do this. But I was, I was really focusing on the need for another level of customer service to investors. So like I said, I was in single family before um, and, and making that transition from single family to multifamily, you know, you get, you get caught up on the jargon, you get caught up on the the definitions, the words and and all that. And, and people that are already in the commercial space, they really try to make it um, challenging to enter into. <laughs> and so I was like, you know, it's, it's not that hard. You know, if you, if you meet the right people, you, you make good decisions um, and, you, and you have the right people, the right network, you can do this. But, but I needed to dumb it down for, you know, the average person and also hold their hand through the process. So what Reno does is we're, we, we're a boutique firm, small firm, 
Um, but we, we offer a white glove concierge level of service where our investors, our clients, I should say, they, they can come to us. They know, they know the level of service that they're going to receive. They know that they don't have to worry about working with, you know, the, the legal team, the title team, the, the lender themselves, we're going to handle everything for them, all the paperwork and just be with them from start to finish. And you don't see that in my industry a lot. Most brokers will make the connection and they'll say, okay, we'll see you at the closing table. You know, here's the list of what you need to get over and, you know, not really be there to explain and, and be there, be there to advocate for them when challenges arise, because challenges do arise every single time. <laughs> and so to have someone there to support them. And so that is how Reno was birthed. Um, and we're going into our third year now. I love it. And I love the fact that you talked about, you know, the industry, right. And and making it difficult <laughs> with all the jargon. And I know that yes. was one of the things that, that struck me is just like trying to learn the terminology because yes. when you're a newer investor, you know, it's almost like it's purposefully, you know, created to be difficult and to be able to identify that newbie. So you can almost immediately discredit them or, or, yes. you know, uh, throw them out from from any real deal, right? And when you're talking to a broker for the first time about, you know, a deal, if you use the wrong words or whatever, you don't know the language, you don't know what they mean, um, it's easy for them to kind of weed you out and, and see you as a tire kicker and not take you seriously. And I know that's a yes. threat for a lot of people. It's a challenge. It's one of the reasons maybe they don't get into commercial because they feel like, hey, you know what? This this group here, these these people, they they are doing this thing, they feel a certain way, and, and I just don't belong. Can you talk a little bit more about that? And just, you said dumbing it down, but the point is making it approachable, right? It's making yes. it approachable for that everyday investor that maybe yes. doesn't know every single term that, you know, our, our brokers and commercial real estate industry likes to throw at us. Yes, yes, it is. You know, I've, I've worked with a lot of sales brokers. Um, I'm friends with a lot of sales brokers. And the reality is, is that they don't want to waste time. And if, if you, you know, you leave a voicemail and you want to get an offer memorandum sent to you, if they don't know you, know of you, or know that you can actually execute and get that deal to close, they are not going to waste their time with you. And so it's, it's very disheartening. And I've seen it over and over again. And I'm like, wow, you could be turning away the next, you know, Mark Cuban or yeah. <laughs> Bill Gates. I don't know. You know, it's like people, you have to start somewhere and to turn your back on, on people and not lend a helping hand and say, Hey, I can, I can tell you when you call that you really didn't know, but here's some direction on the path that you should take. And that's what I want to be in this industry is is, you know, the one who says, hey, I know everybody doesn't call you back, but I'll call you back. I'll kind of give you some guidance and just take a little bit of time to to show you what you what you need to do. I even before we're in the process of revamp and everything now, but I did have um, an ABCs on my website before we re re revamped it. And it was really just to to show people how closely uh, related the uh, vocabulary is in the single family, how it relates to, to commercial, but it's just a different word, you know? So just making it more relatable to everyone. Yeah, I, I love that because I think it's so important to understand that really anything you want to do, whether it be commercial real estate or anything else, is just a little bit of a learning curve, but recognize that the people on the other end, especially the sales brokers, they only get paid when a deal happens. So Yes. In a market where it's hot and they've got plenty of people looking for deals, they are not looking to waste time with someone that is an unknown entity. They'd rather yes. call the guy they close five transactions with and let them know, okay. hey, we got this deal. Here's where we need to be at to, to trade. And by the way, yes. properties aren't sold in commercial real estate. They're <laughs> right. traded. They're I traded. This one too, right? They're traded, right? <laughs> that is uh, they're right. They're not sold. They're <laughs> traded. Uh, so when you want to understand like, hey, what did this trade at? Or what 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 do I need to be at to make to to make this happen? They'll give you kind of that whisper price. So there are little yes. things like that that help you understand where you're at. But it's again, you got to go through a couple of reps, and it helps to have someone yes. like Brandy who can help you understand the lingo and understand how yes. to you know navigate the the environment to make things happen. You said something yeah. a, a little while ago about you know providing that white glove service and being there when challenges arise. 
obviously over the last year we've seen the the industry change a lot the market has changed a lot interest rates have shot up and i know that's made uh some challenges for a lot of investors talk to us about some of the challenges you're seeing with investors right now trying to do deals and how are you helping them navigate those situations yeah, I think the biggest challenge right now is that there's still, and this is for the acquisition side, so there is still a, a big disconnect between uh, buyers and sellers right now. And so sellers, you know, have a pricing expectation of X, Y, Z, and some of the buyers cannot get there. You know, the deals are not sizing out. The rates have increased. And so now there's not enough cash flow to support, you know, a, a 80% loan at a seven or I should say a 6% interest rate, you know? So we're having to, um, we're, I'm doing a lot of underwriting, working with my clients to, to help them formulate what the offer price should be. And if there's, you know, I've had brokers come back and say, Hey, just tell them to make an offer, just make an offer so I can take it to the seller and see if we can make it happen. So I think the biggest challenge right now is that um, the feds just raised 25 basis points last week. Was that last week that they did that? I feel like and every other week they do it. I so. know, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know. And I tell everybody, it's not the fact that they actually raised the rates. It's the speed in which they did it. They did it so fast and, and we hadn't seen them, um, seen the rates go up that fast. You know, I think what it was the eighties or nineties, but I don't even think it was at that speed then. So this is like, this is breaking records here. And so um, what, what's happening, what, what, I, what I foresee happening is the Fed are finally at their goal. You know, their goal was uh, to be at 5%, 5.1. And now they're between five and five and a quarter, which is great. And so they, they're not giving us the commitment saying, yes, we're going to stop. But all the signs are pointing to that stopping right now. What that is going to do is that is going to help investors be able to underwrite and be confident in their, in their, when they submit an LOI. See, when we were closing deals last year, um, you know, it takes 60 to 90 days to get to closing, right? During the 60, 60 to 90 day time span, you had, you know, 150 basis point increase sometimes in the rate. So that deal, when you went under contract, is not the same deal, you know, 150 basis points later. It, it looked different. And there was a lot of retrading going on, and it was a lot of tension, and everybody was stressed out. But what we're going to see, what I believe we'll see now, is we'll see the, the, the disconnect between buyers and sellers ease because the feds are closer to their rate spot. We'll see banks relax a little bit. Banks already have a buffer built in their, their spreads, you know, so they're like, okay, we're anticipating this to go up. We're going to build in a contingency into our rates. Well, they can relax a little bit and they can lo loosen up and investors can feel more confident that when they go into a contract, you know, March 1st, that on, you know, July 15th, that deal will still look like the same deal, that it won't be as as you know, as big of a um, of difference in their in their underwriting. Um, so, uh, what we're doing now is just trying to work our way through that. Is um, the, so to, the biggest challenge to me right now is the rate. You know, the rates are are high. They're high when you're talking about the where the pricing is. So we need all of that to ease. Now, I do believe that a correction was needed because. Cap rates were compressed. It was just, it was crazy out there, you know? So now we'll see things balance out and correct themselves, which is what we needed. Now, granted, we didn't need it to happen at such a fast pace. It would have been nice if it was at a slower pace, but we're just trying to navigate through that. So helping my clients with the underwriting, understanding what um, the cap rates in the market are today is super important, and, you know, really going into the analyzation of, is this seller asking too much in this environment? Um, and I know when I went to NMHC in um, January, so many brokers that I've worked with in the past, they were, they were just like, we don't even have any inventory. 
like sellers are scared to come to market with their property. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's been, it's been a challenge and, you know, I've been doing a ton of refinances. So I'm telling everybody now that if you're in a floating rate, you know, debt situation, try to get into perm debt and, and not, not in a perm debt that's going to have you locked in. So when the rates come back down, you can take advantage. So that's, that's what's been happening. Just a lot of, a lot of refinances and then really trying to, you know, really go into a deep analysis on the acquisitions that are happening. And I'm also seeing a lot of assumptions. I'm working on a lot of those right now as well. Yeah. So you talked about a lot of loan assumptions, refinance opportunities, uh, some of the challenges obviously with interest rates shooting up as fast as they did, you know, that's going to yeah. change that environment because the cost of the capital is going to be increased from the time that some of these people were underwriting these deals. Uh, you mentioned that, you know, you're underwriting a lot of deals, you're analyzing a lot of opportunities right now, cap mm -hmm. rates, you know, maybe coming from being really compressed to starting to uncompress or decompress a little bit there. Yeah. Talk to us about analyzing a deal today, right? Because I had this conversation recently and it's like, you know, what kind of cap rates should you be using? And what I mean is, you know, when you look at sales comps, a lot of those sales comps are going to be from a different lending environment. So how are you blending yes. or kind of accounting for sales comps that don't really reflect today's lending environment? Yeah, it really depends on the market, right? Because we're not seeing a huge change in the DFW market. I'm really not seeing a big change in Atlanta, some parts of Florida, but there are some of those smaller markets. So if we're analyzing a deal now, we may take, you know, 25 to 50 basis points from where, where it was trading at six months ago, you know, because of the lending environment. But if it's a smaller market, we may have to go a little bit more aggressive on what that cap rate was. So maybe last year that cap rate was 5%. Maybe this year is closer to six, you know, depending on, um, I'm struggling a little bit with it. I will be honest because I have national access to CoStar, but when I pull CoStar data, it's pulling data from the last 12 months mm -hmm. and we really can't take that data into account to, to come up with a good cap rate. So it is really taking a lot of digging charting out where this market has been, where it's heading, what's coming to the market, what's driving it, and um, scaling back on rent growth because we, we won't see that aggressive rent growth that we've been seeing the last, you know, five years. Uh, it, it will eventually have to balance out. So, you know, scaling back on that is, is also something that we, that we have to do. So you just have to get creative and really work with a broker um, sales broker that is that that can give you some solid data because I tell clients all the time CoStar is a great tool but it doesn't break down the comps like what we need them to break it down so it may say okay well this traded at you know a hundred thousand dollars a door um, but everything else was trading at eighty thousand dollars a door well what was the difference you know so Working with a sales broker that really has some knowledge of the market is super helpful because they can give us things that traded off market. Um, they have their pulse on what rent, rent comps are doing, what, what rent growth is doing in that market. So it's a compilation of using the sales broker, using CoStar data, and just kind of charting out um, where we think it's going to go and where it is today. Yeah, I heard you say the sales broker is really vital because they're going to be able to fill in the gaps that maybe that cold star report doesn't have. And what, yeah. I, <laughs> what I tell people is that the challenge with any kind of data is it always looks backwards, right? And, and yeah. sometimes you can see trends, but it doesn't necessarily take into account what's really happening real time and also the yes. near or immediate future. And with cap rates, that's one of the challenges. Out of curiosity, I know that we talk about being a little bit creative, but are there other metrics that you're looking at when it comes to, you know, qualifying for a loan today? Like, I'm not sure if there's, you know, kind of a weighted scale, but uh, give us just a little bit of context of like, what are some of the key metrics that lenders are paying attention to in this current environment? Yeah, so I, I actually have, um, I spoke at a conference about a month ago, and I, I did like a short uh a short slide on what my advice is based on what I'm seeing in the lending environment. So if you're going after a deal right now, 
my first thing is stay within the top 100 MSAs. And of that top 100 MSAs, you want to make sure that there's a population over 100,000. You also want to make sure that that the property does not have any um, high concentration of military or students, or if it has a Lura on it, you know, where, which is, you know, high section eight, where you're, you know, high section eight, high affordability, you know, if it has more than 20%, it's not a, it's not a no, it's just that, okay, we have to take a different avenue type of thing. But if you want to do that to make, to make, um, make things easier, if you're already an active investor, staying in the market that you already have property in is going to be key because that's something that lenders are looking for. Not trying to tell you that if you, you know, if you have all your property in Dallas, Texas, and you find a good deal in Chicago to not go after it. But in this environment, the lender is going to be more comfortable if you stay within that area that you're already in, already investing in. And I feel like I've said this so many times, but multifamily is a team sport. So this is really a time where you need to build relationships and make sure that you're building out a good team um, to help you, you know, get deals across the finish line. Uh, oh, one more thing I did that I had on that list is crime. So um, I don't know if you've ever dealt with properties with crime, but I have, and it is, it is really, really a challenge. Well, they all have some level of crime. It's just a matter of what do. kind of crime and how they much all. crime. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So, so, you know, right now, um, if there's been a murder in the last 12 months, that may be a, a no-go in, in this environment, you know, because it's still considered risky. Uh, and if you can get it done, it's just not, the terms won't be favorable. You know what I mean? We, I try not to do hard money deals. You know, I haven't done a lot. I always try to go for the best rate, the best terms for my clients. But in this lending environment, the riskier the asset, the rates are already high. So the riskier the asset, you could be looking at double digit interest rates. Wow. I yeah. think that's great advice and feedback for anyone. And first of all, this is, this is a conversation is not meant to be, you know, uh, legal advice or lending advice. We're just having a conversation, but yeah. I think for, for someone looking at the current environment, you gave some great things to consider focusing on the top 100 MSAs, you know, focusing on areas that have a population of over a hundred thousand people, you know, understanding the, the concentration of students, military, Laura or lower income individuals, uh, and then understanding crime. You know, understanding the level of crime, what kind of crime, and recognizing the impact it can have on your loan and the terms itself. And then, you know, something that feels you know pretty intuitive, but in this environment in particular, focus on areas where you have strengths, you know, either where you already yes. have properties, members on your team are there, but you have a story. If you've done all your deals in Texas and then the next deal you yes. want to do in Michigan, your lender's probably going to scratch their head and, and, you know, that one may not go over as easily as it may have a year or two years ago. So just understanding where you have strengths, the story you're telling, the confidence that you can provide, that's going to be key in this environment. Um, as you look at kind of the future, you know, and just kind of looking out, uh, you know, beyond this year and moving forward, uh, for Reno Capital, just talk to me about, you know, where you see things progressing, who's kind of your ideal client that you're looking to help and where you see the business going from here. Yeah, so um, the last the last few years have been amazing. Uh, we've done a lot of volume, um, and you know when I the the industry specific conferences I went to this year, the hashtag was survive until twenty twenty five, and I was like, no, I don't survive, survive till twenty five. Right. <laughs> I'm like, no, I want to thrive to twenty twenty five, not survive to twenty twenty five. So um, on average, uh, you know, I would say on average, we close about 400 million a year. And so we, we want to continue to do that and exceed that, that number. Um, and, you know, just help clients make good decisions you know, when it comes to their investing and realizing that, you know, I, I hope that my clients listen to the advice that I give them because I've given advice in the past and they didn't listen to me and now they're feeling the pain. So just know that I'm here to guide 
um, and help you make good decisions when it comes to your investing. Um, and so uh, for Reno, we just want to continue on the path that we're doing. Our ideal client is, you know, we do other asset classes outside of multifamily, but multifamily is is just a space for me where it just kind of fell into my lap and I just went with it, you know, and, um, you know, I want to continue on that path, working with clients who are looking to acquire multifamily, refinance their multifamily, kind of build out their strategy and want to get involved into investing to build a legacy for their family. And I feel like that is the, that is the one focus that we don't want to lose. Like, you know, what is your why? Is your why to build this legacy for your family and, and leave your, your kids generational wealth? And if that's the case, multifamily is a great way to do it. It's the, it's the asset class that performs well, no matter what the market is doing. You know, if the single family market is crashing, people still have to have somewhere to live. And now that the rates are higher, like, you know, the people who were in the, you know, sub 500 space to buy a, a home with a 8% rate, they can't afford 500 anymore. They can probably afford 250, 200 because it changes the, the payment that much. So what are they going to do? They're going to have to stay in apartments or maybe rent single family homes. So, you know, we just want to continue on that same path of helping our clients that are looking to invest in good you know, good assets that, you know, are, um, that want somebody who can return their phone calls and actually be there to help them through the process. No, I love that, Brandy. I think the other thing too is, um, you know, it, it's about helping people get from where they're at today to to where they want to be. And you've been able to do that with more of a white glove service kind of approach uh, to yeah. investing. So I think that's really key. Can you just... You know, I think sometimes people look at um, lenders or like a mortgage broker as kind of just like a vendor, right? It's like, hey, when I have to right. go, I'll I'll go out there, I'll find somebody, see who gives me the best terms, and go. And there's different roles that we have on our team. Can you just talk about maybe the importance of having this person as a team member, someone you talk to maybe consistently, not just when you've got a live deal and you're looking for some loan terms, but talk about kind of the importance of having someone like you on the team. Oh yeah, like a hundred percent. So I, um, not only do I have to build relationships with my clients, but I also have to build relationships with my lenders and I do a very good job of that and, um, making sure that I keep my, you know, my ear to the streets, knowing exactly what's going on when it's happening. You know, I, I send out alerts to my clients like, Hey, rates went up today and it, and it hadn't even been announced yet. But if you have somebody on your team that can, you know, give you the updates as they're happening in real time, that can be very helpful to you when you're out there in the marketplace. So that's, you know, a, a huge thing. Um, uh, being there to advocate for you. Now, I have had to leverage a lot of my lending relationships the last, in the last year. You know, and get streams pulled and, you know, make things happen. A lot of people got into bridge debt, not knowing that there was going to be a stress test coming in 12 months to see where their cash flow was. They weren't expecting the rates to be where they are. And so the lender is like, oh, you need to pay down this loan $2 million. When you have a broker like myself, I'm going to get on the phone and I'm going to say, hey, I need your help. <laughs> And make it happen where you don't have to do that, you know? And so having a broker that has relationships and has their pulse out there, you know, knowing exactly what's going on is invaluable. Um, and being able to uh, reach out to them and, you know, get real-time information as to what's going on is invaluable. So I'm not just here for the, for the you know, to get you to close and then, and then I'll see you later. You know, my clients know I get super involved. I actually got an email this morning where I'm helping them uh, reallocate some funds that they had in their in their CapEx reserve over to their interest reserve to help them pay more. And again, I just leverage my relationship with the lender to be able to make that happen for them. So, you know, it's it's a good relationship to have. So it's not always just about 
oh, well, I can save that 1% fee <laughs> and just go direct, you know, because you may not always get the best deal. And these lenders, you know, they look at the client, you know, you go direct to a lender and they look at you like they're going to get one deal out of you for the year or maybe lifetime where they look at it as a broker where they're bringing the brokers, bringing them a lot of volume. And so those re having a broker that has those, rela those relationships, you, you can't cultivate that type of relationship unless you're in the industry or you're doing a lot of volume. I think it's very helpful for everyone. I appreciate you sharing that. And you talked about it being about relationships and being connection or having the right connections for th those folks who want to learn more and to reach out, they can go to renocm.com. That's R E N O C M.com and check out Brandy and her team there. You have a newsletter that they can sign up for and get on your monthly newsletter to get some of those alerts and updates that you just mentioned. Right now, we're going to go to our round of insights. Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. All right, Brandy, give me a failure or an apparent failure that set you up for later success. Oh, a failure or apparent failure. Um, well, I tell you what, move, moving from Indiana to Texas, that was a huge thing for me. And when you, I, it was literally out of faith. So we didn't have anything here. We didn't know anybody here. We got three little kids and my husband and I were like, we got to go. And when we got here, it was hard, you know? So there were some times where we looked at each other and we were like, did we really do this? <laughs> like, maybe we should go back. So it looked as though we were failing at that moment, but it was really just setting us up for where we are today. And so it, it turned out to be a blessing. So I'm glad we did it. <laughs> but at the time you can't see it. So, you know, give yourself time, you know, give yourself patience. Uh, but but for us, that that was big for, for me. Give me a digital or mobile resource you recommend for your business. I am very A-type. Um, so my favorite app is Microsoft To Do. And I have, you know, my to-do list. I have for home, for personal, for, you know, business. And I'm very organized that way. So that is my favorite app, Microsoft To Do. Give me the book you've recommended or gifted the most in the last year. Mm. Always the power of the subconscious mind. Right. So like good go, it is a very good book. It will change your life. So I've given it, gifted it. I, I have three copies at home right now because my copies get beat up, but love it. Love it. All right. We'll make sure we put that one on the list there. All right, give me a daily habit that helps you stay focused on your goals. Mm. Daily habit would be um, affirmations. You know, spending that time in the morning to, you know, read your Bible, if that's what you do, I do. <laughs> read your Bible, spend time in my word, do my affirmations. It just keeps me grounded, keeps me focused. And I also do gratitude um, affirmations every day. So, well, uh, I should say, writing down what I'm grateful for five things every day every morning writing down what I'm grateful for all right give me your number one insight and I'm going to say for selecting the right loan oh selecting the right loan um my insight is having having knowing what your business plan is is imperative when you're selecting the loan because you know, things change, real estate changes, the market changes, but you have to know at least a base of what you think your business plan is going to be because the last thing that you want to do is be in a loan that does not suit your business plan and does not serve you over the next, you know, three years, five years, seven years, whatever that is. So that is key to me is knowing what your business plan is so that you can pick a loan product to fit what, what your needs are. I love that. That's great advice there. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's lighten the mood a little bit. So okay. you are in Dallas or Dallas, Texas yes. area. Give me your favorite place to grab a bite to eat. Oh, God. It's a lot. I will say I do have a lot of favorite spots, but there's a steakhouse. It's a it's a um, it's not a chain. It's owned by a local family and it's called EG Steakhouse. It's a Brazilian steakhouse. And it is amazing. It is the best Brazilian steakhouse you will go to. 
and I've all right. been to them all, but this is amazing. <laughs> Yeah. EG Steakhouse. All right, EG we got that Steakhouse. one on the list. We will check yes. that out next time we're in yes. Dallas. Okay. All right. Well, Brandy, you gave us a lot of great information. I, I loved hearing your story of going from, you know, being in the finance space, being in real estate, you know, being more on the residential side, making the transition over to commercial, three years ago, launching, you know, Reno Capital Management, helping so many multifamily investors you know, kind of get the white glove service so that, you know, the intimidation of commercial multifamily doesn't yes. doesn't stop them from pursuing their dreams and their goals. And just what we need to pay attention to in this current environment, right? I think a lot yeah. of times we've, we everyone pays attention to interest rates, but there's so many other things to pay attention to with terms and having the right lending partner, talk about the criteria for where you're investing and how you might want to adjust that given the current environment and just what lenders are looking for. You know, lenders are going to yeah. want bigger MSAs. They're going to want less risk, less volatility. And they want to see that you have some sort of competitive edge or advantage in implementing and executing your business plan. So make sure you kind of take a look at that as you explore opportunities in this current environment. Brandy, again, for folks who want to learn more about you and your company, they can go to your website, Reno CM, that's R E N C O, I'm sorry, R E N O C M dot com. And uh, I just want to thank you again for being a great guest. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank today. you for having me. Yeah, I look forward to staying in touch with you. Have a good one. Yes, you too.